All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to our uh, first Cosmic Conversation of 2024, where today we're going to be talking, making some connections between the upcoming um, solar eclipse and some various astrophysics content. Uh, and we have with us Dr. Sten Odenwall, who received his PhD in astrophysics from Harvard and we'll leave out the year, but <laughs> uh, a few years uh, ago. There were dinosaurs present at my world, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and as we said, has a long history of lots of really exciting uh, astronomy, but uh, something exciting for this group is he currently works with NASA's heliophysics education activation team at Goddard um, and participates in many NASA programs in space science, math education, where he's the director of space math at NASA project. Okay. I will let Sten start our conversation. And if you would like, you could buy my books. They're on Amazon. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Please, I have a roof that I have to repair. So anyway, okay, well, let me uh, share screen. Oh. oh, one second, Stan. Yep. Oh, okay. Let's try again. <laughs> there you go. Now you try. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. I'm getting really good at this. Um, so, yeah, eclipses and astrophysics. Uh, interesting topic. Um, you know, <laughs> you can't go too far, you know, from a total solar eclipse and not feel that, you know, you're seeing something that's all about astrophysics. I mean, you've got magnetic fields, you've got a corona, you've got the solar wind. Um, and for people in heliophysics, that's why total solar eclipses are such fascinating things to look at. Because it's, it's one of the very few ways that we can get a really good picture of what the corona looks like, believe it or not. Most of our instruments only focus in on the inner part. You know, and getting a big picture out to many solar radii is actually more difficult than you would think. Um, in 2027, I mean, people love total solar eclipses. I mean, certainly my grandmother does or did. <laughs> uh, 2027, we've got a really cool eclipse that's going to pass right across the uh, the old temple at uh, Karnak, the ancient Egyptians. Uh, this is a kind of a photo montage. This isn't the real thing, but it sort of gives you the idea that, you know, if you plus 100,000 other people, you know, go to Luxor, you will see <laughs> in April of 2027, a, a absolutely wonderful, you know, event. And we'll see a little bit of that kind of a thing this April uh, in Texas and up through Maine you know, for the eclipse uh, coming up in North America. Um, related to eclipses are transits. Okay, now we've sort of stepped back a little bit. And um, instead of talking about the moon passing in front of the sun, we're going to talk about one of the inner planets passing across the sun. This happened to be Venus back in 2012. And I, I think many of us that were involved in education, we were there for 2020, 2004, and 2012, and these were really very interesting public outreach events. Uh, a lot of people really got into the transit of Venus, mm -hmm. uh, as they had back in the 19th century, which was the last time we saw one of these things. Well, you know, <laughs> transits are lovely things, and you would think, well, you know, what does that have to do with astrophysics? Well, it, it turns out that the transit of Venus was, was used in the 1800s to determine what the astronomical unit was, you know, and unless you know what the astronomical unit is, you can't really set the scale in a fundamental way to the rest of the universe, because getting parallaxes to stars all depends on knowing the astronomical unit and so forth and so on. So the AU and its determination is a key feature of setting the scale for all the astrophysics that we actually do. So. It's not irrelevant. Um, of course, you know, you can't swing a cat anymore without bumping into a, you know, a damned exoplanet. You know, we got 5,000 of these lovely babies. They're, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, it's just amazing time to be living. Um, and of course, the way that we find exoplanets is primarily as they transit their star and they dim the light of the star a little bit. And so, you know, that's a kind of eclipse. Uh, it's not as dramatic as a total eclipse where the light goes to zero, 
But uh, this is actually a much more useful <laughs> eclipse for us to study uh, if we're hunting for Earth-like stars and things like that. In, in fact, there are a number of different methods for finding exoplanets, but it turns out transits are absolutely key if you want to understand something about the atmospheres of these exoplanets. Because in that little period of time that they're passing across the star, the light from the star goes through the atmosphere of the exoplanet, and any particular molecules or compounds that are present in the atmosphere, they produce uh, spectral fingerprints that we can then detect using telescopes. So that's primarily what the Webb Space Telescope and others are, are working very hard on to study these transiting eclipse-like events. And who knows, we might find oxygen in a biosphere somewhere. <laughs> um, now, taking a, a, a kind of a step back, uh, eclipses were used in a very interesting way when we were first discovering things called quasars. Um, they were discovered in the early 60s, but people didn't quite know what they were. They, they seemed to be very bright stars of some sort you know, with very high redshifts. But then the radio astronomers came along and, and discovered that a number of these things actually were radio bright objects. They were actually radio stars. But the resolution on a telescope, even this large, is not really good enough to really make out much detail in the radio emission from a quasar. So they came up with this really, really clever idea. We wait for the moon to pass across one of these quasars, and we monitor with a radio telescope the radio emission from the quasar during this occultation by the moon. And we get a trace that looks something like this, a uh, moon going from right to left. The limb of the moon sort of intercepts where the radio sources are. Here are two A and B. It produces a very distinctive looking uh, interference fringe just before the eclipse happens, which is that flat part in the middle of the diagram. And then the radio source reemerges, and you get a little bit of radio emission and a kind of a funny wiggle. Well, it turns out that wiggle is an important radio optical feature that you can retranslate into a study of what the structure of the radio source is. Even though the radio telescope can't resolve the source at all, um, by looking at the emission and how it is interfered with by the passing limb of the moon, you can actually make out details in the radio source that are far smaller than what the radio telescope can actually discern. So that's in the <laughs> 60s, uh, how we studied radio sources at, at high resolution <laughs> uh, without having telescopes that were the size of the Earth. This was a primitive radio interferometry method, if you could call it that. And the result was that you know, the diagram on the left is created by this uh, lunar occultation method. And later on, when you could actually get really good images of these quasars, you can find corresponding features in the actual optical emission. This happens to be 3C273, which is one of the closest quasars. And it has a jet, which is labeled as component A. And the radio telescopes were able to discern component B and component A, but you know, not tell you a whole lot more about them until we got really good radio telescopes that could actually resolve uh, the details for instance, like the very large array in New Mexico. Um, that gave us <laughs> almost optical quality radio images of a lot of these things. Uh, another kind of quasi-eclipse method which we use, uh, this takes advantage of Einstein's theory of general relativity, which says that if you look at a star that's very close to the limb of the sun, uh, the sun is producing such an intense gravitational distortion in space-time that the light rays from that background star are actually bent around a little bit. Uh, and so the way this, this theory was proven was during a total solar eclipse back in 2019, where basically you took, during totality, you took a picture of the stars near the sun, and then you waited for the sun to get away from that area and then you looked at the positions of the stars, you know, with the sun not being there, and you discovered that there were a very slight shift uh, in the direction where the sun used to be. All right, and that's exactly what Einstein predicted. 
But the thing is that if you take this to the extreme, <laughs> uh, you can actually create some really interesting gravitational optics. Um, here's a case where you have one star passing in front of another star, uh, very distant star. And the foreground star produces a gravitational lens effect on the light coming from that distant background star. And essentially what happens is, is as that foreground star passes across from our vantage point where that background star is, it causes the starlight to be amplified just a little bit. Uh, this is called a microlensing event. And it turns out that if that foreground star happens to have an exoplanet around it, that exoplanet also produces a little bit of a gravitational wiggle. So this is how we can use microlensing, which is a kind of a form of an eclipse because you've got one body passing in front of another, same kind of geometry. But in this case, you know, you can use the gravity of one to serve as a lens to detect <laughs> exoplanets that you can't possibly see any other way. Um, Here's the case where you can use an entire cluster of galaxies as a lens. Uh, this is a kind of an eclipse, too, in a kind of an odd way, because you've got this cluster of galaxies in the foreground that's eclipsing galaxies in the far background. However, uh, because the foreground galaxy cluster acts as a gravitational lens, it basically lenses the images of distant background galaxies and the distortion they produce are these little arc-shaped things that you see all over the place. Um, it turns out that by knowing where the mass is in that foreground cluster, knowing the masses of each of these galaxies and their positions and everything, you can actually use Einstein's theory of general relativity to essentially create an image of these distant objects that's coherent and an actual image, not just pieces of the image scattered all over the sky. So not only does that prove that general relativity is correct, but it also lets you use the mathematics of general relativity to use this entire cluster of galaxies as a lens <laughs> to look at even more distant galaxies in the background that are actually in some cases so far away that the Hubble Space Telescope wouldn't be able to detect them directly at all. But it turns out gravitational lenses not only refocus the light from background objects, but they also amplify it a little bit. And that amplification factor on the light is just enough to make them visible to the Hubble Space Telescope, whereas before uh, they were basically too far away and too faint to be detected directly. Uh, here's an example of one of these extreme gravitational lens objects. We have a massive galaxy in the center, and the Earth happens to be exactly along the line of sight between the center of that galaxy at the center and one that's even further away. And the light from that one that's even further away is being lensed into a ring <laughs> around the foreground galaxy. This ring of light that you see looks all lumpy, <clears throat> but if you use Einstein's mathematics, you can actually take all those little pieces and rebuild them back into the original image of the distant galaxy. Okay, it, what you're seeing is the same galaxy image multiple times. Uh, each one of these bright spots is the center of the same galaxy. In fact, what you could do with a telescope with a spectrometer is you can measure the spectrum from each one of these bright spots and the spectra are absolutely identical, which means they're from the same object at exactly the same distance or redshift, right? So we're not seeing just some kind of a funky phenomenon of stray light. We're actually seeing this foreground galaxy imaging a background single galaxy so that we can actually study that background galaxy, which I think is absolutely cool. Here's something that's even more amazing. With that same kind of gravitational geometry, the paths taken by the light rays are not exactly the same through each of these clumps that represents the same galaxy. Uh, some of those light rays are delayed and can be de delayed by up to several hundred years. Here's the case where we have five different supernovae, but they're not five different supernovae. They're the same supernova, but we're seeing them at different time delays in the history of the supernova. 
<laughs> in fact, they have found that there is one image here. There is a missing image in this picture. And it should be there because we know what that background galaxy looks like. It's all these gold pieces. And when we put them together, we basically see the same supernova image superposed over and over again at different time delays. But there's one missing. And that's missing because it's the light from that particular image is arriving at Earth before the supernova actually exploded. <laughs> so, so these gravitational lens systems, when we study supernovae and we see multiple supernovae images, we're seeing those images at different times in the history of the supernova. So we can actually probe how a supernova, how a star explodes by, by using these, these kinds of amazing images. Here's, here's a case in point. If you look at the light coming from each one of these supernovae, the light seems to be different. It, it's changing brightness differently in time. But the thing is, they're part of the same object, and we're seeing these images time delayed. All right. And so they're, they're giving us information about different aspects of the evolution of a supernova. And so we can study, OK, what is C? C might be a time delay of you know uh, 300 years or 20 years uh, compared to B. So we'll be able to see what's happening 20 years before B. And looking at the light curve, we can discern what's going on 20 years before the light that produced curve B arrived. It's, it, this, is, this is bizarre stuff. Another thing that we can do with very long wavelength radio waves, long wavelength radio waves are, are really funky. They, they get distorted by just, a, you know, harsh language. <laughs> you know, you, they go through the ionosphere and the slightest irregularity in the ionosphere causes them to wiggle and wave and, and make noise. If you look at the radio waves coming from a distant quasar passing through a charge, a cloud of charged plasma in the Milky Way, it, that cloud acts as a kind of a gravitational lens for the radio waves arriving at Earth because the radio waves travel through different paths through this cloud and there are different time delays involved. So we can actually use clouds in the Milky Way that are eclipsing distant radio sources as lenses <laughs> <laughs> to study these distant radio sources, just like we use gravitational lenses. This isn't gravitational lensing. This is ion plasma electromagnetic lensing, you know, a different concept entirely. But it's the same principle. You know, one thing eclipses another, and you can actually learn an awful lot from that eclipsing geometry that you weren't able to discern before. Here's something that's even, this absolutely blows my mind. The sun at the distance of the Earth has a gravitational field strong enough to deflect starlight by about one arc second. So stars nearest the sun, they get their images deflected by about one arc second in the direction of the center of the sun. That's, that's the way the shift works. If you go out to a distance of 550 astronomical units, that star will be turned into a ring of light surrounding the sun. Just like we saw those gravitational lens galaxies that had the single bright galaxy in the center with the ring of light, well, we are able to use the same principle in our solar system using the sun as that central mass point. And then the light rays from a distant star directly behind the sun will form a ring of starlight around the sun. It's very hard to discern, but it can be done. And the neat thing is that if that ring of light contains light from an exoplanet, you'll be able to examine the image of the exoplanet at, well, by this geometry calculated to be about a magnification of 500 billion times. So instead of a smudge like the one on the left, you might get an image like the one on the right when you put all the data together and look at the information surrounding that, the sun, the, the, the ring of light surrounding the sun. So this is using the sun as a gravitational lens to study exoplanets. So that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think I've, I've gone through, what, 
15, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, that basically has taken you from, from A to B <laughs> in studying eclipses in a whole lot of different contexts. And, uh, you know, we're only just getting started in this business, which quite frankly pisses me off because I'm kind of Perry retired at this point. And it seems like I'm, I'm missing the parade. The, the parade has taken off without me. And all I can do is stand around and watch it go, you know. You know, and all you young whippersnappers, you know, you're going to have all the fun figuring all this out. But anyway, so that that's that's all I got to say. Hope that, well, that uh, was some incredible stuff. I learned risk. so many interesting things. Um, I'm I have questions, but I'm going to pause for a second in case anyone okay. in our community has a question they want to start us off with. All right. And if they don't, I certainly can ask plenty of things. <laughs> Jesse, do you have a burning question? <laughs> um, well, then I'm going to ask one of my questions if people want All to right. think about it for a second. Um, so you have this incredible deep knowledge of all these different ways we can connect to the eclipse, right? And connect mm -hmm. various science content to the eclipse. Mm -hmm. If you're running a program in the weeks leading up, right? And want to get, everybody's excited about the process of looking at the eclipse, but like thinking about other things we can excite them about. What would, what would be something as somebody who is both an astrophysicist and an educator, what would you want to share with like your local communities to get them more excited about, you know, not just what we're looking at, but what it can mean for us. Yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> everybody loves a good eclipse. You know, people are going to travel, in some cases, thousands of miles to get to the path of totality. And they're going to have a wonderful experience. Uh, and then, like a week later, it will be overtaken by some new issue in the news or whatever. And, you know, so our ability to capture their attention is very fleeting. And just between the six of us, the hardest challenge that we have is to do is to talk about eclipses in a way that doesn't trigger people's sort of hostile reactions to learning about math learning about science, and learning about history. Math, science, and history, for most children, are the worst subjects that they have to learn in school. So guess what? We're going to turn them on to an eclipse. They're going to ooh and ah over it. you know. And then when we try to explain what the heck it is that they just experienced you know, in, in STEM, we're treading on the thin ice of subjects that they really don't want to hear a lot about. So that means that we have to be really clever and subversive. Now I can I can do clever, but I don't know how to do subversive, right? I can't sucker people in to seeing that there's some exciting math behind total solar eclipses. I mean, I've tried. <laughs> um, History is absolutely cool. I mean, we've used total solar eclipses to date various key historical events going back thousands of years. I think that's a really cool application of eclipses that I, I think people can resonate with because, you know, what's more fundamental than human history? Except to people that don't like to read about human history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as for the science, uh, I mean, eclipses, you know, offer up all kinds of opportunities to ask questions about, you know, well, what's what is a corona? Why does the sun have one? <laughs> How is that related to the, our sun having a magnetic field? You know, do all stars have corona? <laughs> uh, all very good questions, all questions that are have a scientific basis, but, you know, you're now sort of in a in a situation where you're trying to teach students how to 
think like scientists by asking questions of, of things that are in some sense sort of incomprehensible. So I don't, I don't have any silver bullets. I hate to use that anal analogy because it's a really offensive analogy to me. Um, but I don't know really how to do this. And, and, and I've been trying to do this now for NASA for 20 years. You know, um, and I guess you almost have to take it on a case by case basis. You know, whatever your audience is, you know, see what their boundaries are in how much science they're willing to accept at the moment. And then just sort of have fun with the situation. I mean, the last thing I know that you want to do is, and 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 NASA seems to be kind of famous with doing this, is, oh, at the time of the eclipse, we're going to have the students do that, some activities. No, no, no. At the time of the eclipse, the students are only going to pay attention to the eclipse. They're not going to do a crossword puzzle. They're not going to look for shadow bands. They're not going to do pinhole projectors. They're simply going to enjoy the eclipse. Because for thousands of years, that has been an almost spiritual thing that humans have done whenever these things happen. And if we could get the kids to tap into the sort of cosmic spirituality of an eclipse, that probably is going to pay us dividend, dividends later on. You know, because there's now something that that they got excited about that they have questions about. So, you know, I, I mean, <laughs> this is a, a long answer to a very good and well-posed question. I have to apologize for that. No, that's a fantastic answer to it. Yeah, I appreciated that too, especially from the lens of storytelling and trying to find ways through connection through different stories and how yeah. to relate it to actual space events like an eclipse and how do you sustain that when the eclipse is over, right? Yes. So how do you relate mm -hmm. anything that has to do with eclipse or the science behind eclipse to mm -hmm. real life events that's happening to their communities at this time? So like, for example, I think there's like a SciAct app called the Globe app that's uh -huh. dealing with the eclipse. And I was having communications with some um, citizen science folks around this. How can we sustain this app once mm -hmm. the eclipse is over? Why did we create this whole app for one event? And then there's going to be one in a couple of years. What are we doing? You know, yeah. and it's like, how do we sustain this? And it's like, well, think about where you are in your community, how it can relate to them. So let's say, for example, you're in a suburban or rural area and you want to do something with agriculture and the soil and how it affects things like climate and stuff like that. And using uh, the technical features of the app to sort of relate real time for, you know, mm -hmm. farming. That mm -hmm. can be a cross connection to sustain that interest after the eclipse is over. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. we got that. And as well as the glasses, right? We yeah. have glasses for this eclipse we can still use those glasses to look at the sun whenever we want. We can study right. the spots. We can study the trend. Yep. Like we can keep using those glasses. Mm -hmm. Everyone says it's just for the eclipse. No, it's not. I use it all the time. Like yep. <laughs> if I got those glasses, I'm using it beyond the eclipse. So how can we sustain that with our oh, audience? We have the sun, you know, going up to sunspot maximum. We're going to eventually start seeing yes. some very big sunspots that, you know, back in the old days, you know, they had to have the sun on the horizon in order to see the big sunspots with the naked eye. But now with these eclipse glasses, you can just whip them out anytime and see if there are any big sunspots. Exactly. You know, that, there, there, are, there are three things that, that absolutely fascinate me about, about eclipses. First of all, um, they they tell us that the Earth is, is uh, rotating slower as time goes on. And I think that that is something that I don't think kids are aware of, you know, that that we can use eclipses and where they are, where they appear on the earth historically to figure out that the earth was spinning faster a long time ago. The other thing that is crazy is that um, you had the ancient Egyptians around for 3000 years. And, you know, it's it's legendary that their their main god was Ra, who was the god of the sun. 
but there are no re written records of them ever having written down anything about total solar eclipses. And there were several dozen of them that happened directly over their major cities. So that's a big question. Why? Why do you have an entire civilization for 3,000 years not recording a single total solar eclipse anywhere? <laughs> um, and it's like, yeah, I mean, what's up with that? And you would be interesting to know that 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 is one of the big questions in Egyptology these days. You know, is where are the documents? You know, we, we've got documents from the ancient Greeks that say that the Egyptians were wizards in predicting eclipses. But when you go into the Egyptian hieroglyphics and papyri, there's absolutely no trace of eclipses anywhere whatsoever. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. And, you know, there, there, are, there are sort of questions like that, that that sort of can get you going that, that are post-eclipse. Once you've seen it, you know, there are things related to it that you could kind of start ruminating about but um great yeah i don't know <laughs> um, thank you you have such a depth of knowledge of so many different connections it's incredible yeah. i'm gonna go down a wiki hole of that egyptian history of why they're not look why did they never look at that i was like why didn't they ever look at that well now I'm going to run. I mean, it, it turns out <laughs> that I was interested in ancient Egypt long before I was interested in astronomy. I mean, mm -hmm. they, when I was 10 years old, you know, Boris Karloff's movie, you know, <laughs> got me going and I wanted to know what mummies were. And so mm -hmm. my parents pointed me at our set of, you know, encyclopedias all in Swedish. So I learned mm -hmm. a lot about Egypt in Swedish. <laughs> uh, and then I, I, I discovered astronomy a, a year later. But yeah. I was definitely interested in Egypt long before astronomy. And we'll see, that's now, the cross I'm connection. I'm coming back to my roots, it seems, because. Mm -hmm. you know. No, but that's interesting you say that is like, how can you find a connection through pop culture like movies to, yeah. again, make it relevant to the science and to the community? So yeah. it's like you said, it's that one to one of knowing your community, also yeah. knowing yes. different ways that aren't jargon or barrier infusing techniques you know yeah. like you said using a fun movie like are you interested in the history of mummies or egypt and right, you know right. it, something like that like you're talking to six-year-olds that gets them excited right because yeah. that's yeah. how i'm really thinking about it is like how can you get really young kids interested in what you're saying for more than 30 seconds which is hard mm -hmm. and you know relative relating it back to things that they see and hear in their everyday right. life is one of those reasons and especially if you can find those connections of where their interest lies is the key so mm -hmm. you make it yeah. interest led and i think that's really about asking questions of your community and knowing that community right right uh -huh. yeah Awesome. Well, that's a good conversation. I won't, I see we're seven minutes over. I'm sorry, but thank you so much for, for being here, Stan. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing with our community. This has been incredible today. All right. Great. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad I was able to inspire you on eclipses. <laughs> yeah, this is good. And this is going to be a recording on our YouTube channel as well, where the rest of our network can keep looking at this and referring uh, okay. back to you. And I will certainly share it out at Space Telescope Science Institute where I'm at in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be sustaining oh. my sustaining my interest um, beyond the eclipse. So thank you. All right, fantastic. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>